think about the church, I have conflicting emotions about her. Uh, the church is God's plan for reaching the world with the love of Jesus, and I love what uh, this can look like on the local level, particularly in our city. I love how beautiful and redemptive the church can be, but it's also hard to ignore the damage and hurt that she's done as well, particularly in these last few years. Between the scandals, the abuse, speaking with hate and anger instead of grace and humility, that damage is deep. I know this breaks the heart of God, but I also know there's more to her than this. The church has been where I've seen marriages healed, addictions broken, lives changed, the hungry fed, the orphan adopted, and hope restored. I think of all the churches and Christ-centered ministries we have in Topeka, they are, they're really trying to work for our city, from mentoring kids to helping families in crisis, dealing with homelessness and mental health challenges. This is church as well. So for me, I think the church is at her best when she's stepping into these hard, messy places with the real help and real hope in the name of Jesus. It's about being a redemptive witness to our city for our Savior. And that redemptive witness starts with you. Yes, you. If you're a follower of Jesus, then you are the church and you are God's plan for reaching the lost in the world. So let's talk about how Jesus saw people. 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 How he saw people as being in the image of God, worthy to be loved, and honored, not as an annoyance or an interruption. Let's talk about how Jesus treated people. Let's talk about how he treated them with honor and respect and honesty, even those who didn't believe in him and probably wanted him dead. So let's talk. Let's talk, Topeka. Seven churches with a heart for our city and a desire to be better at being a redemptive witness of Jesus. We come from different backgrounds, different traditions, but we have the same heart to follow Jesus, to live like Jesus together for our city. Seven churches, four stories of how Jesus loved people and how we can do the same. Let's talk. Seven churches, four stories of how Jesus loved people and how we can do the same, starting March 9th and 10th. Hey, welcome to the online community of Fellowship Bible Church. It's really good to have you here as we worship Jesus this weekend. Uh, I realize that some of you are watching from out of state and some of you are traveling or even some of you are homebound. And I just wanna let you know, you're welcome here. We're so thankful to have you. And uh, if at any time during the service, you would like to connect with us in any way, just follow the link that's right below me right now in the lower portion of the screen and uh, it will connect you right to our connection card. And you can fill that out and someone will follow up this weekend with you. So whether you're outside of Topeka or traveling this weekend or even homebound, I think it's really good that you're here and that we can join our hearts and our minds and our voices together in the worship of Jesus. Let's join the service as it begins right now. Cause our God is
Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. Our Lord is risen, and he is reigning, and we are here together as the church to celebrate that resurrection together. So let's lift our voices, because Christ crucified is also raised on our behalf.
be. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are raised to life and we are raised together with you. Not because of anything we've done for ourselves, not because we've been good enough or earned it or deserved it, but because of your kindness toward us. So Lord, thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for your resurrection, which gives us hope beyond just this life. Be glorified in this place like you deserve to be for all that you've done, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, y'all, say hi to someone around you before you have a seat as we continue. He is risen. So for many years, when the church has gathered, thousands of years, the church has gathered with a call and response, and someone will say, he is risen, and someone answers back, he is risen indeed. And so let's join with saints throughout the ages and churches around the globe who are going to be meeting over the next 24 hours and say, he is risen. What good news. We are so glad that you are here to celebrate with us. Fellowship Bible Church is a church that exists to help people find and follow Jesus. And one of the ways we do that is by welcoming people. And we want to welcome you. We are so glad that you are here. Whether you are here for your 1,000th time or whether you're here for your first time, we want to welcome you. We are glad that you're here to celebrate our risen Savior. And if you are here and you haven't connected yet and you want to take a step of connection on your worship guide when you came in at the bottom, there's a little spot for information. And if you will take that and fill it out and go to the Welcome Center, we would love to get to know you a little bit. We have a gift of Thanksgiving for you guys coming. We'd love to give that to you. We'd love to listen to where you're at. And we'd love to help invite you to take a next step. And I have just a couple of invitations for everyone today of things that you can be involved in or things that you can take home with you today. The first one is ShareFest. And ShareFest is coming up on April 27th, and this is just a fabulous day. We've been doing this, I think, for about 18 years now, and it is an opportunity for us to be the hands and the feet of Christ out in our community. And the greatest thing that I have seen that has happened from ShareFest is the faithfulness of us going year after year after year. These schools have begun to trust us. They have begun to reach out for us for things other than ShareFest because we have been faithful on these days in April and we can be faithful at other times. And so will you join us? This is a great, easy first step to get involved in serving or if you've been serving for a long time, this is something that you can do out in the community, outside. I'm hoping that there'll be great weather, right? And we get out there and we'll do some work. And so we have a table or like three tables out there with all the places that you can serve. Be sure to go out there and sign up and we're going to have a blast together. Second thing, I want to invite you guys back next week. We are kicking off a new series in the book of Philippians. And it is talking about joy in the midst of suffering. And you don't usually think about those two words together, right? Joy and suffering. But if you read the book of Philippians, it's going to make a lot of sense. And so we invite you to come and walk through these next four weeks of Philippians with us. We want to invite you back. And one other thing I want to invite you to is we have a resource table out in the lobby. And we have books out there to help with study. We have stories of Jesus. If you are not familiar with his story that you can take and pick up and read more about who he is and what he has done after you hear about what he did today. And we also have daily devotionals that are going to go through the book of Philippians. And we have one month left until we we get our new ones. And we want to provide those for people today free of charge. If you want to go through the book of Philippians with us in April, we'd love to have you do that. Before we get to a time of hearing in God's word, I want to talk about generosity. And we do that every week. And I want to share with you my favorite passage in the Bible that talks about generosity. And it's found in 1 Chronicles, right? And you think, that's not the book I'd go to for generosity. But it's the story of David. And David's on the verge of building the temple, and he calls his people to be a part of it. And they come, and they give, and they give generously. And then David says this in his prayer to the Lord. Who am I and who are these people 
that we can be as generous as this. That we can participate in what God is doing in this world. And I think about that and I think that's who I want to be. I want to be someone who is participating in the work that God is doing in this city and around the world. And that's why I give. And that's why we call you into giving. So that you can participate in what God is doing in this city and around the world. And so we would ask that you'd consider doing that. We're going to um, take some time to pray and get ready for the message. And I just want to remind you, and if you haven't been here in a couple of weeks, we've been in this series called Let's Talk. And we've been doing this series with six other churches in our community. It's called Jesus And. We've been looking at Jesus stories about how Jesus views people. And Joe's going to finish that today with Jesus and you. And so let's pray and uh, thank the Lord for his word. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for just the time to gather with your church family to sing your praises. We are so grateful for who you are and what you've done, and now we have the opportunity to turn to your word. And Father, I pray that you would just be with Joe as he speaks, that you would give him boldness and clarity, that we would better understand who you are and what you've done for us. And so, Father, I pray that we would have hearts that are ready to hear, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear who you are and what you've done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, 315 service. Thanks for changing your schedules to be here on this Easter weekend. Thank you. You're really clearing out space so that we can have room for more priceless and eternal people this weekend. I'm really excited about this weekend. This is good news, folks. This is great news that Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. And it's news that when the first people heard it, their lives were never the same. The Easter message is simply this, never be the same. You ever have a never be the same moment? A time when you thought, oh my goodness, I may never be the same. Let me give you one of mine. It was happened many years ago, and uh, it happened while I was going skiing out in Colorado with my family. My kids at the time were, I think, third and fourth grade, and uh, James and Jack went with me, and Cheryl stood back at the, at the lodge and, and took care of little Nathan, who was probably two years old at the time. But uh, we would ride up. One of my favorite things to do with the boys was the activity of skiing down the hill, and then you could have good dad-son time on the, um, on the chairlift going up. Well, on one of the runs, as we're going up, I'm looking over to the left, and there's a ski jump, one of those freestyle ski jumps. And people were going off of it, and they were doing all these tricks. And whenever you do that with a third and fourth grader, they're going to look at you and say, Dad, can you do that? (laughs) Guess what I said? Oh, yeah, I could do that. (laughs) I could do that. And, uh, you know, the next word said, do it then, do it then. I said, no, guys, if I do it, I'm not going to be doing all those tricks on the guy. I'm just going to go off the thing. And they said, do it, do it. So we hop off the chairlift, and I start skiing down, thinking, what in the world am I doing? And we, we got closer to the ramp, and it looked more like this. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is a whole lot larger than it looked like on, this, on the chairlift. The thing's about 12 feet wide. It's 8 feet high at the end of it. It's 40 feet long. And I know it looked like this, but I told the kids, go down there. Go more towards the landing zone. Stay away from the landing zone, but go down there. And so they skied down there. I just went, oh, my goodness. What have I said? You know, it, it was like this, but it felt like this. <laughs> and so I decided just to kind of push off. And before the way, before I pushed off, there was a dude, a ski dude. And you always have them at these places. He's, yeah, I was kind of panicking, kind of frozen. He goes, come on, old man. <laughs> you know what that does to me? Okay, I'm going, to tell, I'm going to tell you on Easter what it does to me. But I got angry, and I just kind of pushed off. I kind of pushed off, and, and then it was a point of no return. And I hit the end of it, and literally, I came unglued. The, the last thing I knew, my ski tips were up in the air, and I was looking up there, and there was this overwhelming thought, I may never be the same. 
I had pictures of a ski rescue helicopter. Uh, I had pictures of an ICU waiting room with Cheryl and the boys in there. And everything flailed. And, and I don't know what happened after that. My life just kind of went into slow motions. But I hit the ground. And I hit, not like that, I hit on my bum. And everything kind of exploded. It was a yard sale. And my kids, I heard a scream from my kids, and they skied over to me, Dad, are you okay? My wind was knocked out of me. I, I, went, I looked, and I said, but I'm, I, I'm okay. And I, yeah, I guess I'm okay. And then I look up, and guess what's going on? The rotisserie of the chairlift was going with everyone making their comments as I'm sprawled out on the ground there. Those were moments I felt I would never be the same. But some of our fears actually turn into a reality. When something so drastic or so traumatic happens in our lives, that our lives truly aren't never the same. I've got a friend named Dmitro who's a Ukrainian living here in Topeka. And I've asked him to share his story of his never the same moment that happened when war broke out in Ukraine. Listen to this story. Hello, Fellowship Bible. My name is Dmitro Pasichnichenko, and I'm Ukrainian living in Topeka. I was born and lived in Kharkiv, Ukraine, and my own city is the second largest city in Ukraine with population over 1.5 million people. Unfortunately, Kharkiv is located only in 20 miles to the border with Russia, and my own city was a first target during this whole scale war. I have had an inner relationship with God since my young ages, but I cannot say that I often went to church because it seemed that there was always not enough time. But over the past few years, especially since coming to the United States, a lot has changed in my mind and new life priorities have been set. The war in Ukraine began in 2014 when Crimea was annexed and the war in Donbas region started. A war that didn't stop for a single day. Looking at all the years I have lived, I realized that a full-scale war was inevitable. But you can never be ready for that. So the day of the full-scale invasion on 24th of February 2022 changed my life to before and after. My family and I had only one decision. This decision was to leave everything we had to save the most valuable, our lives. The toughest war since World War II is still going on, and since that day, my family and I have left our home and have not had a chance to return. I think that life is about balance in every sphere we have in life. Our way to the USA was very long, but it was here that I felt a miracle happen. I'm talking about balance because we can imagine the scales where on the one side there is the most tragic scene that can happen to humanity, where my family left everything and went into obscurity. And on the other side is all the people who sincerely want to help us and make our lives easier. I'm infinitely grateful to our best friend and his family for helping us come here at a time when it was vital. I'm grateful to our new friends who welcomed us as a family. Also, we have met a huge number of exceptionally kind people here in the United States. And imagine these scales and the two sides, I felt that this is the Lord's plan. I'm sure that the Lord's plan works, and as a result of this, we have a chance to build a new life. A life whose meaning lies in the ability to build relationships with other people and share our kindness. So, yeah. So some of you may have had news like Dimitri have had. Um, I remember just navigating the first few uh, hours after my father passed. And you wonder, how is my life going to be different? In the loss of someone, a loss of a job, a loss of a person you love, those, those moments happen where you go, I wonder if I'll ever be the same again. And you know, that's how it was when Jesus died on the cross with his disciples. They wondered, what have we done? 
uh, our hero, our savior, he died. He had all these promises. He told us what he would, you know, he, what he came to do. We thought it would be a political leader. We thought he would overthrow Rome and the Jews would reign once again in the land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But now he's dead. Will our lives ever be the same? Well, if you read the uh, New Testament account in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them detail what happened on this weekend that we celebrate. Because it was on that first Easter morning, the Resurrection Sunday, that Jesus was declared alive. And the book of John, if you open up now and turn with me to John chapter 20, I want to walk you through how John presents this as a never-be-the-same moment. And it's one that when their lives went down in the negative way, when Jesus died, it totally flipped and did a 180 so that their lives were never the same. And here's my hope. It's my hope that as we spend time in God's word today, and as we reflect on this story, which is told not as fable, but as fact, not as myth, but as real, that we can put our understanding and our eyes will see it of who Jesus really is and what he really came to do, and that we, by faith, would see him and put our faith and trust in him. And then if you are watching things now happen from a faith perspective, that you would have an encounter with Jesus and your life would never be the same. I can say that because this is from the beginning, from the first century on, this is how this story has been told. Not as just a good story, not just a great victory, but a story that when you believe, your life will never be the same. And as, we, as Brian mentioned, we're doing this series with six other churches here in Topeka. This week, we've looked, we, we've looked up to this point. We've looked at Jesus and, and, and people who were desperate. We looked at people who were outcasts. We saw people who just had nowhere else to turn. When they turned to Jesus, they found him, and he, he, brought, he brought them back. And here, what I want to just share with you is there should be a moment in our lives where by faith we consider, who is Jesus? And what do you do with him? We'll talk about that in a little bit. But as we talk about this never be the same moment, I want to talk to you about the external realities that John presents to us in John chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. And here are the four. I'm just going to give the four here, and then we'll go through them. John uses four evidences of the resurrected Christ. Number one, the tomb that once held the body of Jesus was empty. Secondly, there were grave clothes that Jesus was wrapped in on on Good Friday to prepare his body for a proper burial. And there was something about those grave clothes which proved the body wasn't stolen or Jesus wasn't in a coma and woke up and just walked out of the tomb. The other thing was that they actually saw the risen Jesus the physical body of Jesus. And finally, what, what this meant when Jesus showed up to him if they, after they saw him dead was that the promise of Jesus was fulfilled. Okay, so let's look at this first one, the empty tomb. This was a tomb that no body had been placed in, and a wealthy person who was in Jerusalem during the Passover uh, was, it was uh, uh, provided for Jesus. And as the Jewish custom was, is when a body died, they immediately put them in a grave. And they did that because there were no preservatives to keep the body uh, like we would have today if, we, if someone would die in a day and you'd wait five days for that. Especially with Jewish tradition and ritual, they wouldn't allow people to touch a dead body. So the day someone died, they put them in a tomb. Jesus grew up in Nazareth. That wasn't a place for him. That was too far away. So Joseph of Arimathea provided this tomb. And on the morning of the third day, Mary goes. Look at this in verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark, and she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And so she runs back, and she goes and tells the disciples, the tomb is empty. There's no body in the tomb. And Peter and John rush to the tomb and see that there is no body in the tomb. The tomb was empty. But then there was the grave clothes. 
And John is very specific. We can see it more if you study this. And again, I'm not asking you to because I know it, but I know how to study Greek. And the original language of the New Testament was Greek. And John uses three words to tell us what each of these people saw and what they actually saw and understood. And we're going to go through this. They rushed to the tomb. John beats Peter, probably because he was a younger guy, and he beat an older guy to the, to the tomb on a race, and he glances in. Look at how, it's, how John says this in verse 5. Stooping in to look, that Greek word is blepe, and he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. So imagine this. If, if the tomb was this tall, the entry was probably really low, okay? So he probably, that Greek word, he glanced. He glanced in and he saw that there were grave clothes, but not the body of Jesus. And then Peter rushes in. Look what Peter does. Look at verse six. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb and he saw. So Peter goes into the tomb and he saw. That word, that Greek word, is theroi, which literally we get our word theory. And so he looked at that and he was trying to figure out what did that mean? In other words, he noticed something was odd. The body wasn't there, but the strips of linen that would have wrapped around Jesus were kind of collapsed. And we're told earlier in the Gospels that, that uh, about 95 pounds of spices were used in wrapping Jesus' body. And it were, they were tucked in the folds of those of those strips of linen. So if you can imagine this, it almost looked like a, a cocoon there. And he started wondering, what was happening? What is happening? Many of us think, boy, if I was there, I, would, I have much developed mind than an ancient world and I could put it together. No, no, if something like this happened, we'd do the same thing. One of us would look in, the other one would get close to it and go, what does this mean? But look at what happens when John walks in the tomb. Look at verse eight. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. And when he saw, he believed. Okay, that word idon literally means to conclusively by your observation to understand what this meant. And here we see John seeing it and going, wait a minute, he said he would rise. He told us three times in our ministry. We didn't understand it. I understand it now. That moment that John saw it and he understood what it meant, that he rose from the dead, he was never the same, never the same. The empty tomb, the grave clothes, but then there was the risen Christ. And what we see is that word for see, understand, and believe. We're going to see that word just used over and over in John's, John's testimony of the gospel, this good news. Here you would see Mary when she saw Christ. When she saw Christ, she runs back to the disciples and says, I have seen the Lord. The disciples are in a room on the night when Jesus rose, and Jesus appears to them, and, and they report, we have seen the Lord. And then Thomas. Thomas. <laughs> we know him as Doubting Thomas. In reality, if you chafe his life, he was a pretty courageous guy. He just wasn't there when Jesus showed up. And so he said this, unless I can see with my eyes, the scars in his hands, and put my finger in his side where a spear put him to death or, or made sure he was dead, uh, I will never believe. And so eight days later, Jesus appears and says, peace be with you. And he says, Thomas, put your hands here. Put your finger in my side. Stop, stop not believing and start believing. What does Thomas say? My Lord and my God. He not only saw him, but he worshiped him. This is the picture that John is showing to us. It's these people who went to an empty tomb that end up worshiping and glorifying the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. He wasn't just a good man. He was God at this story. And it was a moment that they could never see him the same nor be the same as a result of it. But here's the fulfilled promise. 
In the book of John, there's a kind of a, uh, a, a pattern of words he uses over and over, and that these are Jesus's I am statements. You may have heard him say, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. But in John 11, he says to Martha, he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. He asks her this question, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Well, you see, when Jesus rose from the dead, there was no debate on this. John would even say, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these things that I wrote down for you, these details that I gave you, are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. All of this was shown to us. All of this is interpreted to, to us that Jesus really is who he said he is and did what he said he'd do. He fulfilled his promise. He's the resurrection and the life. I'm looking over this room right now, and I can point, and as I look at into some of your eyes, I can uh, remember the funeral services that I've done for loved ones of yours who've passed. And every funeral, I read this passage. It never gets old to me. Because it's a passage that we hold to by faith, that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. We believe this, and so we put our faith in it, and we proclaim it at perhaps some of the worst moments, because that worst moment is never the same with Jesus around it, right? He's the resurrection and the life. So these are external realities that John presents to us, but there's also internal realities. Internal realities of what happened in the lives of these people that they were never the same. And here they are, that never be the same moment in each of their lives where they moved, moved from doubt to belief, from questions to confidence. Look at this first one, Mary. Mary goes there, and at first, when she doesn't see the body of the Lord Jesus, she goes, someone has stolen him. I don't know where they took them. She runs back to the tomb, and she's weeping, and she's weeping. And, and Jesus appears to her, and he says this, Mary, it's all he had to say, Mary, and she recognized, that's the voice. That's the one who delivered me from demons. That's the one who taught me the word. That's the one who showed himself and revealed himself to me for who he really was. And she turned and she said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. She knew it. That's how they talked to each other. That, were, that was their titles. That was their name. He knew her by name. And when he called her personally, she had a never be the same moment. The disciples are in this room. They hear that Jesus has appeared to Mary. Didn't believe her. Isn't it interesting that Jesus chose a woman to show himself to her as the first person to see the resurrected? And the Jewish men didn't believe her. But Jesus chose to show her that because he honored her. And he appears to the disciples who are waiting, minus Thomas, and Jesus appears to them. And he stood among them and he said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his sides. Then the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. My version of the Bible has glad, but I researched that and it was, no, they came unglued. They worshiped him. They were overjoyed. They were praising him because of the reality of who he was and what he did. Thomas. Thomas again didn't believe. Jesus shows up and reveals himself. Hasn't, opens his hands and says, look at this, put your hand here. We're not told if Thomas ever did that because it was enough for Jesus to appear to him. And he said, peace be with you. Put your finger here, see my hands. Put, your, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, Thomas but believe. I put in the Greek on there how it sounds. I love how it sounds. Thomas, apistos alapistos. Doesn't it sound Italian a little bit? It's Greek. Say that with me. Apistos alapistos. Stop disbelieving. Start believing. 
That was his never the same moment. That was his never the same moment. But it, they didn't just have this moment of belief. They also had a transformation of their lives. They started from this point, not only to believe in Jesus, but to look like Jesus. Again, John writes in verse 31 of chapter 20, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That you might believe, and once you believe, have life in his name. These people were never the same. We see them before, before the death of Jesus, they're scattered, they're scared. Even before Jesus appears to them, they're locking the room because they were afraid of the Jews. But then Jesus appears to them. They believe in him and they start living for him. If you just read the book, the continuation of this story in the book of Acts and just flip through a few pages there, Peter, who denied him three times, is boldly proclaiming before the very Jewish leadership who crucified Jesus that Jesus really is the Christ and you put him to death. Who could do that? His life was radically transformed. And if you just follow the trajectory of these 11, only one John dies a natural death. They all were willing to die. This was something that they had to believe to stand up against persecution and suffering to defend. Their lives were transformed. And then their message was their mission. Jesus Christ has risen. And Mary, you see this from the very first time that when Mary sees it, and Jesus says, go and tell, what does she do? She runs and announces to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And he t she tells them everything that Jesus told her. The disciples, when Jesus appears before them, Jesus says this to them. He said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so am I sending you. This would be a message. They didn't just keep to themselves and keep their little Jesus story to themselves. It was a, a, something that changed their lives, radically transformed it, and they lived to give this story to others. See that? See, that's the problem sometimes of religion is we keep it to ourselves because we want God just for us. But we saw with this message is this was a message they couldn't contain in themselves. They were never the same. Before they were afraid of what people thought of them, before they were afraid of, of all the things that took down Jesus, and now they were willing to stand for him and take this message that he had given them and live it as a mission. John even writes in 1 John, he says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. In other words, I saw the risen Savior. I heard him tell me to go, and I'm sharing that with you so that you might have fellowship with us, and you know, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So internal and external realities of this resurrection story. It comes down, since they had a never the same moment, what about Jesus and you? Have you had that moment where it can never be the same? Where before you may have seen him as a good moral leader, but now you see him for who he truly is. God in the flesh who lived a perfect life, one none of us can live, God in the flesh who died on a cross in my place and yours for our sin, fully satisfying the wrath of God. God in the flesh who rose from the dead, defeated death, rose from the dead, is victorious over sin and death in our lives. And he offers us a never be the same moment, a moment of faith. I want to share with you another story a story of Catherine, who has been coming to our church for a while. And uh, Catherine had a uh, growing up relationship with Jesus. But then something happened in her adult life where she really had to question, what does this mean? And she had a never be the same moment with Jesus. Listen to her story. Hi, I'm Catherine. I am loud and bubbly and energetic. I'm also very type A just a little OCD and a high achiever. I grew up in a Christian home, and from the outside, I was always a good little Jesus-loving girl. Um, I was good at keeping a very structured exterior. 
um, but my interior didn't always match what people were seeing. I always was a good kid and made all the right choices. I was a bit of an actress, so playing the part of a Christian came pretty easy to me. Time moved on and I continued my charade and I married my high school sweetheart and he moved us to Florida to continue his studies at the University of Florida. And while we were in Florida, I worked as a nurse on the bone marrow transplant unit. And if you don't know anything about that type of unit, you come into contact with a serious amount of death. I remember that one month we lost 12 souls to cancer. I didn't have very much experience with losing people. Um, to say that I struggled was an understatement. I started confronting some very real questions about life and death and God, really. Questions like, is God good? And if he's good, how? And even things like, is heaven real? With those questions and my husband's guidance, we started attending a church. We got involved in a small group and I started meeting with an accountability partner. During those accountability meetings, I was able to get some answers to those questions, but also I got led into more questions. She led me to God's word and she prayed with me. By the grace of God, I came to know Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. I fell in love with who he is and I believed his promises about what he said about life and about death. So now I can boldly say, death, where is your sting? <laughs> um, that's a story we hear a lot of here at Fellowship. People who may have been closed at one time who become curious, curious people who become seekers, seekers who find Jesus and finders who follow him. I don't know where you're at on this story, but I know that everything that God has written his word for in this account of the resurrection is written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you would have life in his name. And that means that every one of us has a personal encounter with Jesus. And I don't know where you are in that, but I wanna invite you to the next step, what that might look like for you. For some of you, you just didn't get it until you came and you heard about what this true story is and what it means and that it offers you a never be the same moment. And so by faith, you, you realize that Jesus is God who lived and died and rose for you. And, and you'd like to receive his love and his forgiveness and his work for you through his death and his resurrection. You know, that's not done by you coming to a place. That's not done by you being good so that your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. That's done simply by faith. The scriptures say that it's only by faith that we are saved. And so it's when, when we talk about being people of faith, we talk about trusting in what Christ has done for us. And that really challenges a lot of our thoughts about how, what religion is, because most religions are all about you doing things. And here, Christianity, biblical Christianity is based on what Christ has done for you. So a moment of faith, a moment where you're never the same, starts when you start receiving what Christ has done for you. When you believe that Jesus did this for you, he lived, he died, and he rose again. If you're there and you believe that for the first time, just, just talk to him right now and say, Jesus, I get it. Thank you for living and dying and rising for me. I believe in you. How are you going to do that? Change my heart to look more like you with my life. You see that moment of faith when you allow God in your life through Christ? That's a never be the same moment. There's gonna be some things that are the same. <laughs> Brokenness, suffering in this world. All your wildest dreams are not taken care of when you trust Jesus. But one thing you have, you have peace with God and you have purpose with your life. And that's the confidence that you can have knowing Jesus. That was the confidence of those who put their faith in him in the first century and now that we have in the 21st century. That's what we are finding is we don't escape the problems of this world, but we do have the peace of God and the purpose of God in our lives through Christ. You can have that confidence through faith in Christ. Trust him today.
And for some of you who may have been watching, maybe you made a commitment when you were younger. Maybe your story sounds a little bit more like Catherine, where you're wondering, I said a prayer when I was younger. I said I believed when I was younger, but basically I just don't know now. You know what? You're not alone. We have a lot of seekers here. We have a lot of people who have got a lot of questions. And one of the things that we never try to do is give shame and guilt for the questions that people have. We love to explore with the Bible some answers to those questions. And one thing I've learned is I don't have all the answers to every question in the world, but I do have God's word, which he's revealed in his word, some of the key answers to some of key questions in life. We'd love to, as a church, connect with you And just like Catherine, in the context of relationship, get to know you better, listen to your story, and invite you into a relationship with Christ. And our resource table, I don't want you to leave here if you don't uh, stop by there, if you have questions or want to go deeper in a walk with Christ. We have this little book, which a friend gave to me several years ago, and I just think it's fantastic. It's it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John on the life of Christ in easy-to-read English. How about that, people? And it's about 200 pages, so you can read it in one or two days, depending on your reading speed. But it's, it's a great summary of the life of Christ. If you want to know who Jesus is and understand him deeper, get a copy of this. It's free. All of our resources there are free. We just want to invite you to your next step with Christ. Fellowship family, I want to thank you for being here. And I want to ask you to stand with me as we close and consider this never be the same message of Easter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love in Jesus who lived and died and rose for us. And I thank you for this incredible good news. When in the worst of life, our lives can never be the same. The best of this message is wherever we're at, when we hear it, whatever we're going through, we can encounter the living, resurrected Jesus. And through our faith, Our lives will never be the same. Jesus, work in your church to make Jesus glorified in this world. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a wonderful weekend. Thanks again for joining us this weekend as we worship Jesus together and lean into his word. I want to always invite our online community in to join us in person when you're in town or when you're feeling better and come and worship with a church family who is following Jesus throughout the week. You can connect with some of our events or any of our offerings for programs or ministries that we offer, again, just by following that link that's right below and you can experience more with us. And as always, one of the key traditions we have here at Fellowship is amen at the end of the service. doesn't mean that God is finished working. Matter of fact, he is just starting to work in us as he entrusts people who are priceless and eternal into a deeper relationship with him. And my prayer is for you is that you would reflect Jesus to everyone God places in front of you this weekend. Go now and be the church.